Today's guest is a lawyer turned leadership and happiness coach and the author of The Happiness Recipe. She's the founder of Untangled Happiness. She's a mom to two in a basketball family. Her mission is to spread joy. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. How are you doing? I'm great, Toby. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Mirror Talk. As I said before we started recording, I've been looking forward to this um, conversation because we've booked it for a while right now. And yeah. I've just been looking forward to when will I speak with Rebecca? When will I speak with Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> and now we, are, now, now we are here, now speaking with Rebecca. I'm so excited to learn about happiness from you today. But before we, we start, I would love to learn about your life story. I'd love, I'd love to know about your life journey, you know, becoming a lawyer, to the 20 years plus of working in the corporate industry, for example, and the, the law firms as both as, an, as, as, as both as a lawyer and also an administrator at the same time. How was that experience for you, becoming the lawyer and also, you know, working in the corporate world? So, yeah, I mean, my story, it's interesting. Something you said when we were talking just before we started recording really like resonated with me for my story. And you said something like, you know, happiness, I don't know, but I do know, like, maybe when I get the A plus, I'll get the happiness. And mm. that's literally the story of my early life, right? I was all about checking the boxes on achievement, getting the good grades, getting into the good um, school so I could have the good opportunities coming out of college. Um, and then I, I, <clears throat> graduated from college and knew that I was supposed to go to graduate school mm. and had already ruled out medical school, wasn't interested in any substantive area of the world enough to um, commit to getting a master's degree or a PhD in something. And so that really left, if in my mind at the time, business school or law school. And I basically flipped a coin mm. and decided to go to law school. Yeah. Again, because I thought what you do is you go to school and then you get a good job so you can make good money so that then you can be happy, whatever that was going to mean. <laughs> and got, went to Georgetown Law School, had a great experience, actually really enjoyed the process of learning in law school, um, and then got a job at a big law firm as a litigator. Yeah. And I found myself about four years into that career, married with a toddler and um, at the time, my husband was working in counterterrorism. So he had a very intense career. And this particular night, uh, random Tuesday night, I found myself at eight o'clock in the evening, kneeling on the floor of the bathroom, trying to do two things. One, bathe my toddler before bed. Mm -hmm. And two, on the phone with the cordless phone, this was pre-cell phones, right? So the cordless phone clipped to the back of my pants, earphones in, notebook on the closed toilet, papers everywhere, trying to prepare an expert witness mm -hmm. for an upcoming trial. And I had two thoughts in super quick succession. The first thought was, man, I'm a rock star. Like, this is what, who says you can't do it all? Like, look at me, I'm, do, I'm literally doing it all. I'm a mom, I'm a lawyer, like, this is amazing. And then literally not a breath later was, and I'm exhausted mm. and this is unsustainable. Yeah. And that really kicked off, um, you know, that happened probably 15 years ago. And that really kicked off this notion in my head that had been planted decades previously by my parents of what am I really here to do? What is my priority? What is my focus right now? And I realized through a series of events, uh, including a life-threatening pregnancy loss, mm. that what I really wanted to do was be able to be a mom first. Mm. But I was unwilling to um, give up working outside the home because that was important to me too. Mm. And so that led me down this career path of trying to find a way to balance um, being professionally challenged but also retaining the flexibility to be a present parent, mm. which I was lucky enough to continue to navigate and be able to do, but it took being very intentional and very clear with the people around me about what it was that I was putting first. And that was being a mom. So when there was an issue with school or when there was an activity or when there was a sick kid, I was the one who was first on, at, on call for that in our family. Mm -hmm. And I, and they knew that, and I knew that, and my family knew that. And so it really relieved a lot of that um, tension. Yeah. I, I really appreciate and, you know, admire your strength, you know, to be able to do it all, like be a mother, <laughs> be a lawyer, or well, that's, that's a lot of work to do. I really appreciate that. I really admire that. That's amazing. That's great. 
It's a lot of work to do, but the reality is, I think we're all very strong and very capable of being multidimensional. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that we try to prioritize all the dimensions mm -hmm. and that's what's unrealistic, right? You can't prioritize three or four things. Mm -hmm. You're By doing that, you're creating a lot of unnecessary tension. I was talking with a client some time back and, and we were talking about priorities and I said, well, what is, and I talk a lot about seasons and by season, I just mean, you know, your life goes through various stages and as the seasons change, your priorities might change. So I said to her, this season that you're in, what's your top priority? And she answered to be the best at home and work. And I love that thought, but what happens when you have to choose between home and work? What happens when being the best at home means you can't be the best at work? Or when being the best at work means you can't be the best at home. How will you decide? And we do that to ourselves so, so often where we create this tension and unhappiness because we haven't really made clear our intention yeah. for this season. Yes. So can you advise me on, the, on this right now? Can you tell me how to identify the, the phase of life that we're in or the season of life that we're in and the right things to prioritize in this season of our lives? Are there like yeah. things to look at? I mean, that's, so that's a big, that's a big inquiry, but let's, let me give you a couple of starting points for both of those things. Mm -hmm. So in trying to define the season of our life, and I talk about this in my book um, in more detail, but in trying to define the season of our life, I like to think about what and who are taking our time, energy, and attention in this season. Yeah. And really thinking about when might that change? Because that might be the outer boundary for the season. And it really is just sort of coming up with a concept of, okay, like where I'm sitting today, and I'll give an example in my own life, where I'm sitting today is I am two and a half years into building a coaching business. That's my season. I'm an entrepreneur and a relatively new entrepreneur. And so that means a lot of things for my priorities and my focus and where my attention needs to go or where my attention could be pulled. Mm. So it's just that simple. It's not, you don't have to overcomplicate it. That's my season. Yes. I'm in a business building season. Yes. Now, um, one little side note I want to add is that sometimes our seasons can shift and we don't realize it. Mm. And March, 2020 is an excellent example of that. Why? We all went from, I was in a business building season. I had just launched my business in January of, oh, well, I guess it was January of 2019, but I had just launched really the coaching piece of my business in October of 2019. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I was not just in a business building season, but I was in a business building during COVID season uh, or during a pandemic season, however you want to phrase it. Yeah. Right. And so just recognizing that shift might change the edges, might change the size of the container, might change what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things that I like to do in my own life, when I recognize like, hmm, things aren't feeling as comfortable or happy as they have been, I will ask myself, has my, my season changed? Mm. And often the answer is yes, yeah. that something has shifted about who and what is demanding my attention and energy that I need to sort of like address and re-examine, is this still the right priority? Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Yeah, yes, yes. So that's seasons. <laughs> Now you asked another question that's a little harder to resolve, which is like, how do I decide what's most important? Yes. Um, and I say harder, not because it's not because it's complicated, but because it's difficult. It's actually not complicated. Um, and I would say the first thing to do, and it goes to sort of the same thing you were looking at to evaluate your season. You just do a more complete inquiry of what is actually in my life right now mm. and how am I spending my time? And what that inquiry is going to tell you is it's going to tell you what you are prioritizing. And then the question is, is that what I want to be prioritizing? That's a challenging question. <laughs> yeah, when I was really think deep to know, okay, is this more important than this or that thing? Yeah. And you, yeah, and you really literally need to sit down and take an inventory. It's not enough to just say, and I've done this, I've seen this with clients, with myself, um, where you say, well, yeah, but I I'm prioritizing my family. And then we sit down and we literally look at the schedule mm -hmm. and out of, let's say your, I'm not great at math. So give me a minute, 15, 15 hours awake during the day, mm -hmm. you are spending two of them with your family. Mm -hmm. Can you really say you are prioritizing your family? No, no, you can't. Probably not. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so what are you prioritizing? Yo, that's whatever else is in those 15 hours right yeah, yes. and so what does it look like to shift that priority what would you need to change if you really were going to prioritize your family and it might not mean changing things every single day mm. but it might mean being really intentional about say your 15 waking hours on friday saturday and sunday mm. You know, I mean, it's like you have to look at it holistically and it's not just a time consideration. I want to add that too, right? Like it's not just about hours in the day, but that's the first place that we see it. It's also about where is our emotional energy going? Where are our resources, like financial resources going? Like what are we really in quote unquote investing in? Mm. What are you prioritizing? And it, I think just sometimes just doing the writing down for people can unlock a realization that, yeah, you're right. I'm not where I want to be. And there's a lot that I want to change. Mm -hmm. The next step though, would be to take that inventory and say, what do I have enough of? What do I want less of? And what do I want more of? And really think it through in a very sort of like step-by-step -step detailed way. So again, not complicated in terms of a, pro a process, but difficult because you have to ask yourself the hard questions and you have to be willing to hear the answers. Mm. One has to be very strategic in the way of, you know, placing it all down on the table to arrange or rearrange and set priorities. Yeah. 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 And, and really to, I mean, some of it also is reconnecting with your trust in yourself that what the, what you're seeing there and the reaction that you're having and, and the answer you want to give should be honored. You know, I find a lot of times with people, it's like, oh, I see the picture now, but I don't want to admit that actually in this season, I want to prioritize my career mm -hmm. because I feel like as a parent, I'm supposed to want to prioritize my family. True. True. That could be very sad. Yeah. <laughs> and let me be clear, prioritizing something doesn't mean that you don't also care about or love something else. Mm -hmm. It just is a decision-making tool. How will I know where my energy will go first or mm. most? And so, I mean, I tell a story sometimes that growing up, um, I had a mom who was a corporate lawyer and she worked for a very large company. And when I was in about seventh grade, so 12-ish years old, um, she was put through a leadership development program at her company. And one of the things that they did was sort of an exercise like this. And... Um, she identified that her top priority was her career. And so she came home one evening, I'm an only child and we had a, a dinner family meeting. And she said, you know, my homework for this leadership development program that I'm in is to tell you guys that I'm gonna put career first. Mm -hmm. oh. And I was 13 or 12, whatever I, I was. And I literally said, this was my response. Well, duh, because she'd already been doing that. I saw it, but she just hadn't named it. Yeah. And there was such a relief in knowing because then as somebody who loved her and cared about her and wanted to invest in her happiness and success, I could support that. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to wonder if something came up at work, I knew she was going to miss the whatever to deal with the work crisis. And that was fine. Mm -hmm. And so it removed all this tension that could have been there if she had not named it. And it didn't make me feel any less loved. She was very clear in her love for me, in her care for me, and that I mattered to her. That's different than choosing to prioritize work for this period of time. Yeah, that's awesome because some people feel a little bit abandoned or they feel like they're in the second place to work, for example, to the mom. They're like, mom, why don't you take pick me off over work? Why am I not much more important to you than the work you have to do? But you didn't feel that way. That's, that's good. Well, and I, I think I didn't feel that way because she was honest about what was going on, right? And it's like, I think even I've seen it. So my kids now are 17 and 13. And when we can sit down and be honest about where we are, why we're there, mm -hmm. why it matters. Like, it's, I'm not building a business just for me. No, I'm building a business because it's what I believe my mission is in terms of impact to the world, but also it's for my family. Yes. And so if I can explain that to them and get them on board with that, then if I have to prioritize my business sometimes over some event of theirs, I mean, they're, they're a little older and they care a little less, as I'm sure you can remember from the growing up process. But, yeah. um, but that said, I mean, if I can make clear the why, that the what and the why, 
it's a little easier to understand. Mm, that's true. So uh, let's talk about, about the why and your mission. I, I love your mission so much. You know, it's to spread you know, joy to the whole world. And you're doing an amazing job with that already. So what, what inspired you to live you know, 20 years plus of experience in the corporate world to become a leadership and happiness coach after so much yeah. success? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a little crazy, right? But, um, but no, I mean, here's, here's the real deal. So I spent a long time in law firms and then I decided I wanted to try something a little bit different. And so I left law firms and went into, um, to be the COO of a small investment firm. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a lot of fun. I was like, Ooh, this whole being in a smaller organization and having more impact thing is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but that organization for a variety of reasons, didn't grow the way that we had anticipated when I took the job. Mm -hmm. And so I joke with my former boss that he laid me off, but realistically we decided it made sense. It didn't make sense for me to stay there. And so I found myself a little bit at loose ends and, and thought, you know, did what most people do when they find themselves out of work, which is panic a little bit and apply for every job you think you might be qualified for, right? Yes. And then I sort of took a step back and said, well, hold on. Like, just because I can do a job doesn't mean I should do the job. Mm -hmm. And what do I really want to do? And so I actually hired a coach who helped me engage in a really thoughtful inquiry of what it was that had made me tick from a professional perspective, kind of the common themes that had been there throughout my career and what I really wanted to do. And I feel like I had reached a place in my life where my job had to be something where I was showing up to serve. And that could have been a lawyer job and it could have been, um, you know, a COO kind of job, but what felt right was really doing a job where I could pull the, the common thread of what I like to do is enable the success of others. And I want to go get certified so I can coach. Yeah. And so I went to UC Berkeley's executive coaching um, Institute and with the intention of really just getting the, the, just polishing off what had been you know, I managed a lot of people, coached a lot of people throughout my career. So just kind of polishing off those skills um, and going back and coaching, coaching in law firms, coaching lawyers on how to bring leadership and management skills into, into law firms, because in law school, you don't learn how to be a leader. And so you have a lot of people running a business who have no management experience. And so I thought there was a gap there that I could fill that might be interesting to fill. Hmm. And so the very first day of the Executive Coaching Institute, they do an exercise called the Soul Por Portrait. And you have to stand up in front of a room of relative strangers, your cohort, um, and answer these really like sort of deep questions. And they asked me, what is your purpose? Mm -hmm. And I said, to spread joy. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, where the heck, heck did that come from? Because <laughs> I've never had that thought before. Yeah. And I don't know what that means. And am I really spreading joy if I'm going and coaching lawyers to be managers? And I could be, right? Because I think when you make an organization run more efficiently, when you make teams run more efficiently, when you make the employee experience better by improving the quality of management and leadership, that's a pretty joyful thing. Yeah. But what became clear to me as I came out of that experience and began coaching people is that what I really like doing is helping people along the path that I walked myself, which is moving out of this idea of happiness comes from the shoulds, the should do's, and helping people reconnect with the want to's mm -hmm. so that we can really find happiness, even in difficult situations, even in it's not about finding the perfect job or the perfect partnership or the perfect situation or having the perfect bank account number, none of that. It's how do you know what makes you tick, what makes you happy, what really drives you? And how do you have the um, resilience to adjust your priorities as life's seasons change? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's very great. As a, as a professional myself, I'm still going to come back to ask you about questions, you know, regarding to professionalism and how to find clarity in professionalism. But Right now, I want to talk about that your mission to spread joy, to you know, to make people happy. And I was I was, I was reading through your, your the description of your book on Amazon, mm -hmm. um, the Happy Recipe, and it's titled "The Happy Recipe: The Powerful Guide to Living What Matters." Yeah. So in, in the description, something captivated, something touched me or resonated with me. You wrote, "We are born to be happy. Somewhere along the line, our lives get um, clustered." 
Yes. So can you tell me about this book and what inspired you to write this book of recipe for happiness? So <clears throat> that's, I mean, that's also a big question. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I think you like that, that sentence, you hit the nail on the head, right? Like we are, I believe we are born to be happy. And I believe that what happens is that a lot of the conditioning and messages that come from the world around us about where happiness comes from really mm -hmm. clutter up the process. Yes, that's true. And so it is about sort of seeing through those and reconnecting with yourself to figure out what matters. Mm -hmm. What inspired me to write, write the book? I mean, <laughs> by now you should have the gist of my life is like it all just sort of, I, I have this notion that is all, it all just sort of happened the way it happened, sort of mm -hmm. like standing up in front of a room and admitting that my, my purpose or my mission was to spread joy. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said, I was really in the early stages of my coaching business when COVID hit. And in the US or where I live, everything closed down around March 13th. Mm -hmm. And I had had plans to, you know, I had done enough coaching where I was like, okay, now it's time to really narrow down, like, who do I want to coach and what do I want to coach them on? And it's not looking like it's going to be lawyers and leadership. So let me reach out to my network and see if I can do kind of a series of lunch and learn type informal presentations just to put out there what I'm up to and to begin to crystallize my frameworks and my approach. Like that was going to be a way for me to write it down, you know? Yes. Um, and then COVID, boom. And I was like, well, <laughs> nobody's having lunch and learns anymore. Everyone is just holding on for dear life. So they, you know, as they figure out and navigate this transition to a completely um, virtual environment for mm -hmm. most of the people that I was talking to anyway. And, um, and so I got an email that somebody was holding a, re a virtual writer's retreat. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh. Well, that's interesting. Well, that's another way I could do the same thing. I can just use this as a container and accountability to document this stuff that might become a series of trainings, a series of blog posts, something, but it's not going to be a book. Mm. Like I'm not writing a book. Yeah. I literally said in our first writer's retreat meeting, um, which was in May of 2020, I told my little cohort, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to write every day. I'm going to write the requisite number of words, but I'm not writing a book. I have no plans to publish a book. Hmm. And then I started writing and I started <laughs> organizing my thoughts. And about, you know, a week and a half in, I was like, yeah, I could write a book here. Hmm. Like there is that there is enough here to be a book. And the, and the, really the driver was how do I document what I've learned, the toolbox that I have, like what I'm about how do I document that? And so that was where this book came from because what I am about is again, helping people who have achieved success. And that can mean very different things to different people, but find themselves unsatisfied or unhappy and feel like something's missing. And that's so many people that I talk to um, who are like, oh yeah, like I've checked a lot of the boxes, but like here I am and I'm like, question mark, is this it? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes. Um, and so really, you know, I even had, had somebody uh, reach out to me who had had the biggest payday of their life. Mm -hmm. And they were like, but I'm not any happier. Mm -hmm. And I thought money was it. And it's not. And I say that with no judgment because for some people money is it, and that is okay. Mm -hmm. If in your, in, in a particular season, money is it for you, mm -hmm. like, Congratulations, that's amazing. Yeah. But if it's not, that is also okay. You mm -hmm. haven't done something wrong. You just haven't found the things that are it for you, the ways you wanna measure your personal fulfillment and success, yeah. not the ways the world tells us we should. So that means happiness is, um, is not like, it does not have a particular definition. Happiness does not have a particular definition. It depends on indiv individual. 100%. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the happiness recipe, it's funny, I was talking to somebody and they were like, well, there is no one recipe. And I was like, right, just like there's no one recipe for chocolate chip cookies, sure. right? Like everybody has their chocolate chip cookie recipe that their family is, has made or insert any dish here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so the same thing with happiness, what I endeavor to provide is a toolbox and a framework that you can use when you need to A, 
find for the first time your happiness recipe, but B, when you need to tweak it because your season has changed, Hmm. when you need to re-examine it because circumstances around you have changed. It's the same thing like, you know, when you, when you think about, um, baking a cake, you don't bake it the same way when you're at sea level that you do in the mountains. So you have to tweak it. Mm -hmm. And this, what I really wanted was a book that people could walk away with practical tools and exercises that they can kind of pull off the shelf and execute when they need to. Yes, that's awesome. I'm going to place the link to this book in the show notes for this episode. So anyone who's interested could just click on the awesome. link and go to your website also and read more about your, your, your amazing work and everything that you do. So um, if you could educate me a little bit more on happiness, can you tell me how we could identify the essential source of happiness? <laughs> so I have a, 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 an exercise that I like to do with people, and I'm going to give you two options. I can, I can explain the exercise or we can do the exercise together with you answering the questions. Okay. And I don't care which way we do it. <laughs> yeah, but could. I'm not going to force you to be on the hot seat if you don't want to. Yeah, you could you could ask me. I'll, I'll, I'll place myself on the hot seats to okay, help perfect. other people. Yeah. So we'll see how this works. So what is something that makes you happy? And I want to be clear, no judgment, just answer the co- first couple of things that come up. Yeah. Uh, first thing that came up was something, this, this moment right now. Okay. This makes me very okay. happy all the time. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm going to grab something to take notes because it'll help me. Yes. So what is it about doing this that makes you happy? Yeah, the, the ability to, you know, have wonderful conversations, educative, informative conversations with people, learn from it. And also having that mindset that, oh, a lot of people will hear about this also, learn from it also. That really gives me happiness. It makes me happy. It makes me joyful, actually. So I heard three things in there. I heard kind of this idea of connecting and having conversation. I heard learning for yourself. And then I heard sharing that learning with others. Yes. I want to pick pick one of those. Just pick one and tell me what is it about that that makes you happy? Yes, um, the, the ability to you know improve my life um, or the possibility to improve my life through those conversations is what makes okay. me happy. Like, yeah, I'm going to be a better person after this, or I'm going to my horizon be widened after this, for example, or yeah, my eyes will be open okay. to things I've never seen before after this. Okay. That and you're going to, in a minute, you're going to feel like, will you, will you ever stop asking this question? And the answer is I will, but what is it about having a wider horizon that makes you happy or the possibility of a wider horizon that makes you happy? Yes. Um, no, normally I believe that um, you, I, what cannot know everything in this world, a lot of things that's uh, left uncovered. So the possibility to, the, or the, the chance to, to widen my horizon to a particular limit g- gives me the chance to say, yes, I know I've uncovered an unknown again in my life. I've uncovered an unknown. unknown. I've learned something okay. new that I didn't, I didn't know before. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Okay. So I could keep going. And or if we, if we were, you know, if I was coaching you, we probably would keep going. But in the interest of not doing this for <laughs> too long, I want to stop there because it's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. And so the way that I would construct this, you've given me a lot in what you just said, but one of your essential sources of joy mm is uncovering unknowns. Yes. And so what does that mean? How is that useful information? Well, let's say we repeated this for everything that you could think of in a short period of time that would be an answer to what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. You could have a menu that on a hard day or when your happiness feels like it's just not all the way there, you pick from. Mm -hmm. So you probably already know that you love to learn, but you could literally say, you know, next Thursday, if you're just having a heck of a day, you could stop what you're doing and say, I am going to go and learn the most random thing I can think of, something I know nothing about. Think of a topic you know nothing about. Let's just say hypothetically that it's painting and you could Google, how do you oil paint and watch three videos. And that would probably be delightful for you because it's like, well, I had no idea. That's how that worked. Yes, yes, that's true. And that you'd get that happiness hit Mm. from that moment. And so the idea is like you're, when it comes down to it, what really makes us happy are these essential things Mm. that have, that don't require us having the perfect job, the perfect bank account, the perfect partnership. We can inject these things and automatically lift our energy, our vibration anytime we want to. And the, the important part of this 
tool piece is not so much just, okay, keep living your life and inject more happiness. Mm -hmm. But often people come to me and they're like, I have to change something. Like I'm so unhappy. I have to quit my job. I have to find a new job, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. What happens when we're in that mindset is we are in the mindset of escaping our unhappiness. We're running away from something. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it limits our thinking. If instead we can get to a happier place where we are today, even in the not perfect job, even in the not perfect relationship, even in the not perfect world, mm -hmm. then we can architect our happiness and have opened a much wider range of possibilities in our thinking, mm -hmm. which is going to have better long-term results than escaping our unhappiness. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it makes and sense. so that's how I use this piece is really just to help help level the playing field and get us up a little bit so we have a perspective on where we want to go instead of just trying to run away yeah and this makes me remember something i read from your website um, called untanglehappiness.com you wrote that unhappiness is not a problem it's a puzzle yeah so it's like you know trying to fix this puzzle um you know, arrange the puzzle in order to get happiness out of our lives i assume that's exactly right. And I think, I think it's, that's the key, right? Because if we look at it as a problem, it's something we have to make go away. It's something we have to solve. If we look mm -hmm. at it as a, I just don't have the pieces in the right place yet. It's then way more achievable of like, oh, I just need to shift some things around. I just need to look for these essential places that I can inject more and then I can build from here. Yes. Yes. So it's like rearranging those pieces of your, of your situation or circumstances to, before you see a picture and say, yes, this is what I was looking ah, for. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the other way that these, this, that exercise that we just did can be useful is when you're thinking, I, I work with a lot of people who are like, I want, I might want to change my career entirely, but I don't know to what. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when we dive into the essential pieces, we can often construct kind of almost a job description without a title of what would my job have in it if it were perfect? It would have flexibility. It would have lots of opportunities to uncover the unknown. It would have a chance to help people is what I heard from you say, or like a chance to, to share with people outside of me. It would have a chance um, for me to have meaningful connection. Like you can imagine if we did this for an hour of time, you would have this laundry list, this wonderful you know, inventory of what you need in your life to be your happiest. Yes. So let, let me inject this here right now. Uh, do you have like courses or like, you know, programs that you offer to people to, you know, to fix this post or to arrange this process of their lives? Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, my focus has been one-on-one -on -one coaching and people can learn more about that at my website. Mm -hmm. um, but I also am launching in the, in the process of launching something that I'm calling the Butterfly Society, which is like a hybrid membership group coaching experience um, where people, where, where there will be educational course content, there's going to be group coaching um, probably weekly, and then some outside experts coming in too to offer supplementary um, modalities and approaches and thoughts around like things you might want to try if you're needing to shift your energy or needing to reconnect with yourself or you name it, right? Yeah. Um, and so th that is... Um, the doors to that, I'm not sure when this episode will air, but the doors to that are opening soon and I'll continue to take people um, kind of on a rolling basis. So, yeah. yeah. Now I understand why there is a butterfly on the cover of your book, <laughs> the Butterfly Society. But yeah. does, does, does um, butterfly have anything to do with happiness or does, is there like some symbol to it or something? Well, you know, the butterfly actually ties in. It, um, the butterfly is there because... Um, a couple of years ago, as I was in the process of starting my business, I had a good friend who was sending her daughter away to college, her firstborn away to college. And she was doing what parents do in that moment, like celebrating and grieving and struggling and all of the things. And I said something to her. I said, you know, hey, this is so exciting. This is her butterfly season. Mm -hmm. We get to see her spread her wings and, and you know, and fly. Yeah. And then as I reflected on that conversation, I was like, well, if my butterfly season was when I was 17 and went to college, like what's the rest of my life? Mm. I want this to be my butterfly season. And I, then that sort of clicked for me that, oh, wait, it is. Like, this is a whole new expansion, a whole new moment for me. Yeah. And our life is like that. It's cyclical. We go through, and so it ties into the concepts of seasons, right? Like we go through seasons and some of them are cocoon seasons where we're tighter and closer and learn, you know, healing or growing. Mm -hmm. And some are caterpillar seasons that are a little bit simpler and more straightforward and less dramatic. 
And then some are our butterfly season. And so the goal is to like empower you to have the tools for all of them, but like then also to really put you in a place where you can take off and fly. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very good. So for example, um, I have this illustration in my head right now. Like sometimes we have a glass, right? And maybe of water, for example, and that could be um, described to uh, or could be compared to our happiness. So sometimes it's like half full or at the lowest or to the, to the brim, to the top, to the peak. So is there like a formula to have maximum happiness, make our cup always full of happiness all the time? <laughs> um, and yeah, so this is another one of those places where like, again, deceptively simple, but not necessarily easy to execute. In my mind, the formula for maximum happiness is as simple as doing more of what matters to you and less of the rest. Mm -hmm. But obviously that requires identifying what matters to you and what's possible in this season. Yes. It requires then also doing that, like really living. And we talked about this at the beginning, like taking stock and really making sure that there's an alignment between what matters to you and how you're spending your time, your energy and resources. And then in the middle of all of that is like, do you have the beliefs, the supportive beliefs and feelings, the mindset that allows you to execute on that formula? Mm -hmm. Can you say no? Can you release guilt? Can you believe that you are enough? Can you believe that you deserve to be happy? Can mm -hmm. you believe that happiness doesn't have to be bought with your struggle or your hustle? You know, there's all of that that can get in the way of executing on that formula. And so it's kind of those three things that I take, not in the order I just described them, but first I talk about closing that authenticity cap, gap, really getting clear on what it is that matters to you and being willing to share that with the world. Yeah. Then I talk about closing what I call the emotional energy gap, which is the whole mindset piece. And then I talk about actually doing the thing, closing the physical energy gap. And how do you do that? And does that require, you know, goals or plans or new habits? And what's the difference between, you know, like energetically and also in an execution sense, what's the difference between making a habit and, and, a, and then achieving something or doing something? Because I think that gets lost a lot too. So that, that's true. So one has to be authentic to is yourself, you know, to be happy. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so. I think the more that you can show up, first of all, the more that you can really know yourself and then the more that you can show up in the world as often as possible as your whole self, the happier yeah. you're going to be. I mean, that is a big part of it. Yeah. And there's one thing you mentioned, you talked about saying no. Can we ever say, can we ever say no enough? Like, um, no. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is no. Uh, but, but, you know, I think, we don't, I mean, as a, as a world and think about it this way from the very, how many kids have as one of their early words, the word, no, I don't think so many kids are, well, I mean, some do and some don't, but like it comes pretty early. Cause it's just that one syllable and they hear it a lot because you're telling them no a lot. And so it comes back out at you. Right. Uh, yes. And then the first thing we do when they start saying it is we say, no, you can't say that to me. Like I'm your parent, you don't get to tell me no, mm. right? And, and not in every instance, but right away we're training out this ability of saying no. Yeah. And then we expect to be able to get to adulthood and effectively set boundaries and effectively say no when we have never learned that that is an okay thing to do. And I say that with no criticism to parents. I understand parents need to be in control of their children. And so there is a limit to there's a boundary that they have to set. But I just say that to say that we are not trained and not encouraged, even from a very early age, to say no. And so I think we don't say no nearly enough. And I think what we don't realize is then that actually in refusing to say no to the things that we don't want to do, we're actually saying no to us and to what matters to us oftentimes. Mm. I mean, true. time and energy and most resources are finite to some level, right? And so if I take my time, energy and resources and spend it on that thing that I should have said no to, I cannot spend it on something else. And that something else could be something else that matters to me more. That's and true. so actually saying no is critical to your happiness. Mm -hmm. And so I like to ask people when I work with them, like, when's the last time you said no? Wow. I can't remember the last time I said no. <laughs> and you're not, by the way, you are not even close to alone, right? That is a normal, that is a normal thing. And so if you can't remember, then chan then I can tell you right now, you're not doing it enough. Mm. I, was just saying no. I don't even need to know more details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So what, what would you advise someone who comes to you and say, oh, Rebecca, 
I'm so much in a sad state right now. Everything is not working well. Um, how can I find happiness into my life? How can I get that just a little ray of sunshine of happiness into my life? So I think we've talked about two powerful things you could deploy in that instance. The first would be really to think about like, where does your hap- where could your happiness come from? So it's that what is your essential, essential source kind of exercise. The other thing that can be helpful, even in that instance, is to take that inventory. Mm-hmm. Because what happens oftentimes is where our focus goes grows. And so if we're really focused on things not working, we're not even noticing the things that are. And so when you're forced to sit down and take an inventory, you realize, okay, yeah, you're right. This part is not working, but also I do have this, 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 and this that are. And so maybe if I can just shift a little bit of my focus there, then the other things will begin to correct, you know? And so it's some of it. So it's both of those things, knowing how to inject more of the positive, but then also knowing how to keep the focus on what's working wherever you can, or at least reminding yourself of that. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now I would love to, you know, learn from your knowledge as an um, executive coach, you are certified as an executive coach who is, you know, passionate about helping driven professionals live easier, happier, priority aligned all lives as we've talked about already. So from all of this experience and knowledge that you have, um, how can we find more clarity in our lives? So I would say that the single most important thing that we can do when we are lacking clarity is slow down. Hmm. Well, how are you think, slow down in the, in the fast world? Sorry. Uh, that's about <laughs> saying no, my friends. That's where the saying no comes in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, I do think like the, the clarity will not happen if you are not intentional about seeking it. Hmm that the world is not wired to facilitate clarity. Hmm. The speed with which information comes at us does not encourage clarity. It encourages overwhelm, Hmm. right? And so to create clarity, you have to be intentionally seeking it. And to be intentionally seeking it, you have to be willing to slow down. Hmm. You have to be willing to have that conversations with yourself about why you're making the choices that you are or what other choice would be available to you or what what you would choose differently if you had the power you know or insert thing here you have to be engaged in that self dialogue mm-hmm. which requires space and time yeah, yeah. i also think not surprisingly given that i am a coach mm-hmm. that having a supportive cast around you mm. who can help you engage in those kinds of conversations is important. That could be a coach. Yeah. Coaching, I think, is great. Yeah. It could be a therapist. Um, mental health support, I also think, is great. Mm-hmm. It could be a mentor. It could be a partner. It could be a friend. It could be a family member. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell you you have to hire a coach, but I think. There's something about the iterative process of working with somebody who can push you and ask you questions and even just um, summarize what you've said Mm -hmm. so that you can hear it back. That can be really important to that clarity process too. Yeah, that's awesome. And I I like what you said earlier, you know, with with the rate at which we get information right now in this world, it could be very overwhelming. So yes. how, how can we deal with this overwhelm? How can we overcome this overwhelm? How can we just, you know, pause, slow down and process the old thing before taking steps? So, I mean, I don't have a great answer. I don't have an answer that people usually like because my answer is you have to choose to do that. Mm. It has to be a choice. A choice, yeah. You have to say, I'm carving out these two minutes, these three minutes, this half hour, this day, this week. Um, And I get a lot of, you know, especially with busy professionals, right? It'll be like, well, I I take vacation, but I work through my vacation. And I, that's a choice. Mm -hmm. It is a choice. It might not feel like a choice, but it's actually a choice. Yeah. Yeah, well, sometimes, you know, you, you say, oh, I, I have this very big dream, this very big vision, and I have to sacrifice um, my time for it. And sometimes, you, you, sometimes I hear a lot that, oh, I don't have a choice. I have to do it because 
it's my vision, it's my purpose, it's my, it's my race I have to run or something. And I just have decided not to buy into the notion that we have to buy either success or happiness mm -hmm. with our time mm -hmm. or with our hustle. I hate the notion of hustle um, because I don't think it's true. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you've got a really big vision for your life, a really big goal that you will get there faster if you were to carve out time to be intentional. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> we can argue about that. We could even do a test if you want, but I'm, I'm pretty confident mm. that what you feel like you are taking, you actually will gain more than you took mm. by taking it. Uh, Play with it, try it, find, and, and like, there's no magic, like, there, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, the, what this means in order to have clarity, you have to meditate for 20 minutes a day. Nope. You don't have to meditate if meditation doesn't work for you. It doesn't have to be 20 minutes a day if you don't need 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Start with whatever feels attainable and then experiment. Mm -hmm. What if, for example, especially for those of us who are working from home these days, what if while you're eating your next snack or drinking your next cup of water or drinking your next coffee, you just turned everything off. Mm. And for whatever time it takes to do that, you're just with yourself. Mm. Yeah. Because think about that. When's the last time you've just been with yourself with no music in the background, no podcast playing, no, you know, somebody that you're talking to, no scroll on your phone, no game that you're playing, just yourself. It's, it's quite difficult, yeah. <laughs> I would just say maybe it's quite uncommon mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it is difficult if you're not in the habit of doing it it feels super weird mm -hmm. um, early in the pandemic I started taking a lot of walks and my inclination initially was and it had always been when I exercise I listen to something that's my chance to like listen to a book listen to a podcast listen to music and early in the pandemic I said okay I'm going to try this I'm going to walk with nothing mm. just myself I'm gonna take myself on a walk and see what happens. Yeah. And like the first five times I was so like, just mentally fidgety. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, why is it so quiet? Whoa. Yeah. But once you ease into it, then it was like, I was like, oh, I can just be with my thoughts. And I, I don't have to actually control them in any way. I don't have to think about what I'm supposed to be thinking about. I don't have to get mad that I've, <laughs> my mind has wandered off and I've just missed the last chapter of the book or the last 10 minutes of the podcast. And do mm. I need to go back? No, I can just be with myself. Yes. Yes. I, I try to do and that also like sometimes, not all the time I go on walks without music on or podcast on, but I end up talking to myself throughout your walk <laughs> I just keep no, on that's talking. fine <laughs> because you're but 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 that's it like your your voice you're hearing your own voice at that yeah. point and that yeah. is important yeah. yeah and I find that now I mean now that I've done it enough I can choose like I'll go on a walk and I'll say okay like and I did a lot when I was writing I'd be like okay this is the section I need to write like I'm just going to plant the seed that I'm going to work that out while I walk mm. Wow, that's amazing. That's a good tool, actually, to connect with yeah. yourself. Yeah, yes, that's yeah. good. So for another advice, what advice would you give to professionals who, you know, want to step into their leadership presence? How, how can we do that? So the biggest thing I would say, um, and this is where a lot of my leadership, there's two, a couple things I'll say. This is where a lot of my leadership coaching focuses. So especially as kind of emerging leaders, you know, newer leaders, mm -hmm. uh, people have this notion that there is a quote unquote good way to lead. And that that is, it requires doing something other than just showing up as yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and so the way I see it is like, you know, they'll look around them and say, well, the other people have this and do, they do this. And when there's a conflict, they handle it this way. And so that must be the way to handle these things. Yeah. And it's, it, it doesn't have to be. And so the key actually, I think, to being a good leader is to really figure out who you are as a leader. Hmm. What makes you, as you are today, a good leader? Yeah. That ties very closely into the other issue that comes up a lot. And it's sort of this like imposter syndrome. Am I good enough? Are they going to figure out that they made the wrong choice putting me in this leadership position? Um, you have to take it face value that you're there because you deserve to be there. Mm. 
Otherwise, the inquiry of who I am as a leader goes nowhere, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> it's, true. De- it's a dead end road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so there is some work that to be done for most people in getting past the, am I enough? Am I good enough? Am you know? Am I going to be found out? Stuff mm. too. So when I work on is ourself, you know, to be able to have that leadership position or presence in in the industry or in corporations. Yeah, and I think, look, I have a, I take the position that, you know, well, it may have been true in the past that there was kind of like an archetype of a good leader, mm-hmm. more and more organiz- organizations are realizing that um, good things come when we let people show up in authentic ways. Yeah. That's where innovation comes. That's where growth comes. That's where good teams are built. And so... I do think, like I have said, that authenticity is the new presence, right? That it is not about developing some gravitas or confidence or like, I can stand here as a leader and be strong. It's about actually like, this is who I am. This is what I'm good at. These are where my limitations are. This is where I need help. I can be a little bit vulnerable. And by vulnerable, it doesn't mean you have to show up and like sob in front of your team, but just that you can admit when you've made a mistake or when you don't know something or when you need their strengths to shore up your weaknesses. That's all part of leadership. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I've already learned so much from you already. I've learned about happiness. And I learned that happiness does not have a particular definition. That's one thing I'm taking from this. It yes. depends on, on the individual. And yes. also as, as a professional, I could live you know, an easier, happier. And you know, priority also is one thing I learned. <laughs> you have to set the priority. What is important to you? Do more of that. What is less important to you? Do less of that. Yes. That's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. Is, have is a... that... Sorry. Go ahead. Is, um, so... Is there um, anything you love to tell the audience, like, um, for example, your executive coaching, one-to-one coaching that you offer and your book, are they like the best ways to connect with you or work with you um, in this regard? Um, yeah. So the best, I mean, the single best way to find me is actually, and, and the book and to find me on social media is to go to my website. And that is very simply untanglehappiness.com. Okay. And every that's one-stop shop for everything. So yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it too.